Okay, so this is just to give you kind of a, some feedback on what's going on. Remember, case A and B were the ones with 10 species. Cases C and D, it's on here. Cases C and D were the ones with 25 species. And cases E and F were the ones with 50 species. And in each pair, the balanced one is the first one and the unbalanced one is the second. Balanced, unbalanced, balanced, unbalanced. And essentially what I want you to see is that when we have a lot of every species, so in this case, in the case A, we have 10 individuals of each of 10 species in our fauna or flora. All the estimators get the right answer and they all essentially home in right on. When we start unbalancing them, notice that we're, we're pretty close, except Chow really messes up in one case. No, that's Chow 2, 9. Because it, was never, it wasn't seeing all the way up to 10. That was the problem. Okay? So, in this case, um, only nine species were observed. And Chow was really not extrapolating because all nine of those species were seen multiple times. Okay? It's basically just bad luck in 10 samples. We missed one species consistently. And we did check that species is in the fauna. Uh, ICE did a better job there. In another example with B, with the unbalanced small fauna, um, Chow did right on and ICE did a little bit off. Now when we go up to mid-level faunas, uh, a little bit of tendency to underpredict. Okay. When we get up to these big faunas, we're not even close. Okay. Which is to say, nobody observed more than 33 species of the two that we, that we got back. 36. Okay, your F. Okay. My bad on that one. And what do we see? In one case, in the, in the balanced huge fauna, we see everybody gets kind of the wrong answer at 33. All of the different indicators. And then look at case F where it's one common species and lots of singleton species in the fauna. Ice is way off with 84. Chow is closer at 52. But essentially all I'm after is to show you, one, that you need a lot of individuals from which to sample, which is to say, if the individuals ha of a species have a low probability of ending up in a given sample, you're in a lot of trouble. Okay? If you go out and collect, you know, a hundred leaves, don't do this because the botanical garden people will probably get upset. <laughs> if you go out and take a hundred photographs of plants, um, out here where there's probably a flora of several hundred, then the probability that a given species is represented is quite low. And you're falling into this category down here. And you're not going to get the right answer. Okay? It's only when populations are relatively high, and so each species has some chance of showing up in a given sample, that you can, in 10 samples, get the truth. For things like this, remember, we've only sampled 10 times 10, 100 individuals, okay? So the probability of seeing all 25 or all 50 species is pretty low. And our estimators really can't get us to that either. So 
Um, my point is, number one, that you, you need to try to be up in this category, A or B, relatively common species. And um, you also can learn a bit of a lesson that sometimes the best thing you can do, to, several people asked me was, how do I know which is the best estimator? Okay, and sometimes the answer is, I don't know. And other times the answer is, why don't you do the test and find out? So I, I put this test together in a few hours. But you could imagine generating data sets that are sampled from tiny to huge faunas, totally balanced, slightly unbalanced, more unbalanced, massively unbalanced. You can imagine varying a bunch of things separately, impose different kinds of sampling, all in a virtual world. And you could probably get to a, um, a very interesting view of when each estimator tends to fail. I mean, in this case, we have sample sizes per condition of either one or two, okay? Be nice to repeat that a few hundred times. So sometimes you need to step back from the real world stuff and understand the tools you're using, okay? Even if it's, it doesn't have to be publishable, could just be this exercise, and right away you see, okay, 10 samples of 10 were kind of enough to deal with a fauna size of 10. They did fairly bad with a medium-sized fauna, and they really did a bad job with a big fauna. So I'm either going to need more individuals or more samples. And you could potentially explore both of those. Any questions about this exercise? What were the bottlenecks that held people up? Did you not get your data to work in Estimate S? Raise your hand. Getting Estimate S to work. <laughs> Estimate S to work. Okay. Uh, but people on PCs have gotten it to work, correct? Okay. So, so maybe check with colleagues. I'm happy to try to take... You do? Okay, good. Anybody else have trouble getting Estimate S to work, period? Everybody's got it working. I think the world's about to end. <laughs> That's never happened before. Um, anybody have trouble getting their data to load in Estimate S? Raise your hand. Okay, it's working now, good. But was anybody completely stymied by that? Okay, good. So, you know, if you want to pursue this further, do something like, it'll take a little bit more of data munging, do something like, you know, take that data set that I gave you from your country, take some taxon that you care about, and you're going to have to distill it down to unique records of each species. You're going to have to distill that down to, sorry, unique records of each species in each time period, right? You have to figure out what time period to use. If it's, you know, all of the, all of the records from Kenya from all of history, maybe you don't want to do it at the level of days. Maybe you want to do it at the level of years or decades, like I did with the Nairobi data set. Okay, so you have to kind of distill it down, distill it down, and then you have to turn it into a matrix. So the way I usually do that quickly and easily in Excel is via something they call pivot tables. Uh, if you're in Access, it's pretty easy to do a cross tab. Um, again, you have to kind of play with the data but if you're into this, figure it out. 
and do a completeness analysis of you know, the birds of your country or the plants of your country or whatever. Mine is not about data. It's about uh, the diversity of the, the estimators themselves. Uh -huh. Because there are quite many. And uh, if you write a paper and you use jackknife one, someone will ask why you didn't use K1. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether there is a particular manuscript that recommends under the different conditions that you can keep referring to. Yeah. Because then in our case here, for example, my jackknife got a better estimate yeah. compared to all the others. Yeah. But then you want justification that because my sample was like this, I went for the archive. If you can't report all this. Yeah. So I will admit to you that I looked at the literature rather quickly and I didn't see a big review paper. The closest thing was that Walther paper and I kind of didn't like how it synthesized. Uh, it didn't really set up a common metric and we call it a bake-off. You know, where, where all the ladies of the village prepare their nicest pie, and then all the men go through and try all of the pies and decide, okay, so-and-so made the best. So um, I, ha I couldn't find the review paper that did that kind of competition. If I were paying attention to that field, I'd set up the big simulation and sampling study. Um, I think that Rob Colwell is working on some big steps forward. But what do you do right now? What I would do is look for a review and see if I can discard one or two indicators or metrics based on their behavior. For example, that exponential curve always tended to underestimate faunas. It did it for Soberon and Jorente, it did it for us. Okay, for me, for, for Nairobi. Um, I would, if I find a review that basically says for this reason and this reason, the, the such and such metric is better, I would cite that and use it. But when you don't have an indication from the literature and something that you believe, something that you find to be convincing, then sometimes the best thing to do is to uh, present several. Okay? Now, you'll have a better, any real data set, you'll have a better convergence than you saw in this. This was a small number of individuals and a small number of samples. So, you know, when you have no reason to choose, then don't. Because if you choose without something to cite or some reasoning, then you're just setting yourself up for any reviewer who likes something else to criticize you. Yes. Okay? Because I, I was, I've not read the reference from Annie about uh, K1 and 2. Otherwise, for them to move from 1 to 2, maybe they was preference. Because I've actually uh, seen the paper that seems to be saying K2 is better than 1. I can't just remember the reference. They're really very similar. If, uh, they're essentially the same. The thing is that Chow 1 is for the individual-based data, and Chow 2 is for sample-based data. So they really are the same thing. It's just that Chow 2 is translated to deal with samples instead of individuals. Okay? That's the only difference. Other questions? Downloading what? South African data. Ah, okay. Better I'll just give it to you off of my computer. It's too big. It's too big. I can just put it on a USB drive. I have a USB drive that's big enough. <laughs> well, I wanted your, your comment on this. I read a paper, I think it's in the African Journal of Ecology, uh -huh. where the author put about three or four estimators together, and then he took the average. Okay. So there's, there's one way to deal with differences. Mm -hmm. You average them. You make the differences go away. It has the advantage of getting essentially the, the will of the many instead of the opinion of the one. Mm -hmm. 
has the disadvantage that if any one of those estimators is bad, it's voting in there, okay? So um, I personally would just rather see all of the estimates individually, okay? okay? Only because I always want to be able to think about things in a more unitary fashion. Um, I may be able to think about, okay, Chow 2 is a little bit sensitive to the fact that species that have been seen three or more times don't participate in the estimate, okay? So I might think about, hmm, is there, it, imagine we're talking about singing birds, okay? When, I, when I'm doing an inventory, maybe I have five trails that go out of camp. Mm -hmm. And I may have some actively singing male of some species that always sits 20 meters out that trail. And so I may be able to go out that trail and always see him, okay? The first day that I saw him, he was a singleton. And so my estimate goes up. And the second day that I see him, I, know I can go back to the exact same place and I know he'll be there. Boom, it brings my estimate down. And the third day, it no longer participates. Mm -hmm. So if all, if all I really wanted to do was get my inventory done, what I would do is I would see him twice and then I would go like this or not go out that trail, <laughs> okay? What I'm saying is be conscious of what each estimator is doing. ICE is looking at relatively infrequent species, but not just singletons and doubletons. So it ought to be a bit more robust. And rarefaction is going to do a different thing, and jackknifing is going to do a different thing. So the most powerful thing that you can do is really try to understand those estimators. In general, I try to stay away from consensuses, averages, combinations, because it it just feels to me like a way of letting everybody vote, okay? So that'd be my, my suggestion. <laughs>